This is a peer learning series, as you would know, as it's our very first session um, out of eight that we've planned. And today we actually hope to get into the essentials of youth -led advocacy. And we have um, three uh, discussants uh, who, would, who will be joining us today to share their experiences, their insights, um, all of that. And you as participants are also more than welcome to join in um, in the dialogue and uh, post your questions, share your uh, comments and so forth. Um, so before I hand it over to uh, Shihara for her opening remarks, I'd also like to quickly mention um, that we do have Tamil uh, simultaneous interpretation available today. Um, all you would have to do is in the bottom uh, line, you would see like a globe icon. Um, you would just have to click that and uh, select Tamil if uh, you have requested it in your registration form. Um, we did have a few requests uh, for uh, about one or two requests for other languages. We did try our best to make that available, uh, but unfortunately uh, we could not make that happen. Uh, but after the series, we do hope to develop some material in uh, the other South Asian languages as well. So thank you everyone once again for joining. Um, I would now invite Shihara Ferdinando, who is um, the Meningage Global Youth Reference Member, uh, as well as a Meningage South Asia Regional Youth Committee Member, uh, to provide a few opening remarks and introduce uh, our discussions for today. Thanks a lot, Rinish. Thanks, Aldonishi. Uh, so first of all, a very good day to all of you. I'm not going to specify good afternoon or good evening since all of us are from very different areas of the world. I um, hope everyone's keeping safe. So first and foremost, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first session of the peer learning series organized by the Meningage Alliance titled Young People Can Transform South Asia's Future. So this peer learning series has been organized in close coordination with the Meningage Alliance South Asia Youth Committee, which I am part of, as Renushi just mentioned. Um, so just to introduce who and what exactly Meningage Alliance do does, we are basically a global alliance working with men and boys for gender equality. It is our belief that men and boys need to be part of the solution as allies to women's rights and other social justice movements. We use a feminist approach with human rights based principles while promoting transformative masculinities, which participants will learn as we go forward. So our advocacy efforts aim to promote the uptake of accountable feminist informed human rights based and gender transformative policies on engaging men and boys in women's rights and gender justice for all. We strive to put women's girls, LGBTQI plus people, and the most marginalized communities at the center of our advocacy efforts. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three esteemed panelists for the session today. So our sessions are the first session is gonna be themed along the essentials of youth advocacy. So firstly, we have Chamatya Fernando. She's a youth activist who represents a world association of girl guides and girl scouts. Secondly, we have Dakshita Vikramaratna. He's a development practitioner striving for social justice and a board member for Women's Deliver. And thirdly and lastly, we have Simananti Thanendiran. She's an executive director of the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, and also a regional feminist organization working on, a sex on sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender equality. So we really hope that all of you will be able to engage with all the discussions, all of the panelists here today, because we are trying to make it very interactive as possible. And it's definitely going to be insightful um, for you as well. So please feel free, do not hesitate. If you want to engage, please always make sure that you can unmute and in order that then it's gonna tell you how the procedure is going to go. So always feel free to engage with our panelists today. Um, so with that being said, I will give it, hand it over to Renushi to take it through with the rest of the proceedings today. So thank you very much. Okay, so we have some uh, responses coming up. Um, someone says, speaking up to raise awareness about something, uh, raising your voice for change, uh, to influence people to take decisions that will improve our lives and the lives of others, uh, coming together to, much, uh, to a much common agenda, raising your voice to make a change, um, creating a platform to highlight or lobby for a burning issue. And someone else has said advocacy means to bring in light or to speak on someone's behalf, showing similar gesture as them. It could be on thought, feeling, and or behavioral level. Um, and someone else has said when your voice translates into action. 
and advocacy is a modern platform in which we can easily speak for our rights. So that's um, some very interesting responses. And as you would notice, um, it's uh, this whole concept of advocacy is multidimensional. There are, there are various ways to um, understand it, interpret it, uh, put it into action, um, and see how that means to all of us as individuals and even as a collective um, in our lives. So. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, maybe we can uh, return back to some of these uh, comments uh, when we do get into the discussion. Uh, someone else has also said speaking out and taking action to bring change in, for example, change policies or regulations, implement a measure, allocate funding, provide support to bring social change, the result we are trying to achieve, yes. Um, so thank you all so much. And uh, these are some very interesting questions and also goes to show how multidimensional and um, how much of a scope advocacy does offer. Um, and as youth, uh, we do have a very important role to play in it as well. Um, so let's get into that discussion now, but feel free to continue um, submitting your responses. Hopefully we can go back to it um, uh, later towards the session. So. I would actually now um, in, like to hand over the session to Dakshita, um, who is, is our first uh, discussant for today. And uh, Dakshita, if you could uh, just, you are someone who has had a lot of experience, um, both at the national, regional, and global level on a number of advocacy platforms. So drawing from your experience as well, and some of your insights, could you just talk to us a bit about what advocacy entails, especially with regard to the South Asian region and as it relates to young people? Thank you, Renoshe. I hope I'm um, edible. Yeah. Audible, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes it's a, it's a, it's a, It has been a long week in Sri Lanka. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me uh, to share some of my experiences with all of you. It's really glad to see a lot of young people attending uh, a meeting uh, on this weekend, uh, particularly from Sri Lanka as well, given the challenging environment we live in currently. Uh, so my name is Dr. Davikramaratna, uh, and I uh, work in Sri Lanka um, and also uh, in the Asia regional context in terms of policy advocacy. Right now, I work for the United Nations Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I would like to uh, sort of focus my um, uh, sharing with you on a couple of points today, uh, particularly around uh, sort of what advocacy entail. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are very familiar with advocacy. When I look at the Mentimeter response, it was very clear that a lot of people were sharing about how what advocacy means to them. And then I would also uh, hope to share some of the experiences personally and uh, share some of the challenges I have faced in terms of advocacy. And I know that we have two fabulous speakers along with me, Chamathe and Shiva, who would also touch upon these points in terms of sharing their own experiences at the local, regional, and the global levels. Um, so uh, before I actually start talking uh, about my experiences in advocacy, I'd like to play a small video. This video uh, is done by a, a global uh, non-government organization called Child, uh, sorry, it's not Child Fund Plan International. Uh, it speaks particularly around the importance of young people engaging in advocacy. The whole video is, uh, is for five minutes, so, uh, but I think, uh, so you just you know look at it for like two to three minutes and then engage in the conversation. So I would uh, really uh, request support from either uh, Renushi or any other colleague from uh, Men Engage Alliance South Asia to play the video. Yeah, Dakshita, give us a second. Sure, no problem. In the year 2000, the leaders of the world promised to get all children into school by 2015. But today, 58 million children are still missing out on the opportunity to attend even one day at primary school. 
That's terrible. I know. It's not fair. It's more than the population of South Africa out of school. The people in charge should be doing a better job. Exactly. Without universal education, nations will have more poverty, worse health and more war. My little brother, he's meant to be starting his education next year, but his school's just closed down. Oh, right. The building was badly damaged in an attack and nobody can say when it is going to reopen. Meanwhile, my brother and hundreds of other children have nowhere to learn. What are you going to do? I can't just sit and watch it happen. No. No way. You know what? I'm going to protest. Yeah. And campaign uh -huh. until they open the school again. Brilliant. Not just for my brother, but for all the 28 million children who are out of school because of conflict around the world. Leone? Yes? I want to help. You? Well, we'll need to be organised, Johnny. I can do that. We'll need to get people inspired. Not a problem. We'll need to learn how to make change happen through the power of advocacy. The power of advocacy? All around the world, young people have got together to demand that world leaders deliver on their promise of universal education. And we're being heard. Cool. But more help is needed. Count me in. An organization called PLAN worked with loads of young people and some amazing organizations like UNICEF, UNESCO and A World at School to develop an advocacy toolkit. This toolkit provides everything you need, whatever your campaign, to join the millions of young leaders around the world. To, to advocate, advocate for, for change. change. As Malala Yousafzai said, it's time to speak up. I'm going to be like Mahatma Gandhi challenging injustice. Or Nelson Mandela inspiring change. If you say so, Johnny. Right, so what do we do first? We can follow the steps in the toolkit. We need to make We're a plan and then talk to the video now. Now. We should research the issues so we can properly argue our points. And find Thank you, Renoche. Um, so I'm sure uh, you know, all of you watched the video uh, sort of you know, uh, got an idea in terms of um, what advocacy means and why it is important for young people to take up on advocacy. And, and the generic understanding of advocacy is that, you know, public coming together in terms of supporting an idea, a particular course of action or a belief. Um, and uh, it can be in the form of anything. In my opinion, it can be a forum, it can be a discussion, it can be a publication, or it can be an activity you are doing. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you are doing, having this engagement in terms of creating some social change. So it could be a systematic change in your community or in your society. It could be a political change. It could be an economic change. It could be a more of a scientific change. Basically, through this intervention, through the change, what we are trying to um, uh, achieve is to influence the decision makers who are in decision making capacity to create a policy change so that it will solve the social issues we are working on. And when I say decision makers, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be politicians or parliamentarians or world leaders. It could be anyone who is sort of holding some power over the issue we are working on. So for an example, it could be a community leader uh, in a freelancing context. It could be a ground military officer or a divisional secretariat. It could be any administrative officer uh, who has some power in terms of creating some change, uh, influencing a particular policy. So what we have to, what we aim to achieve is that through our action, that first particular person who has that influential power to um, create that policy change so that through that policy, the, the, the social issue will be solved. And, and that is a general sense of advocacy. So, you know, I don't need to go into details about, you know, who young people are. Most of you all are youth activists uh, and most of you all are engaged in the Men Engage Alliance in terms of the work they do around gender equality and women empowerment. Uh, you all know that you know, young, the UN definition is uh, between whoever is aged between 15 to 24. And right now uh, in the world, there's almost 19% to 20% of the world population is young people. And it is important that that 20%, one fifth of the world population engage in solving these social issues because those issues actually matter to them. And they are the ones who are really facing those issues. And, you know, South Asia, the definitions of young people change from country to country. Sri Lanka, it's 15 to 29. I know some of these other countries, it goes up to like 35 and 40. Uh, but the, the important thing is that whoever is within the youth definition 
faces those issues in their own way. So we cannot really generalize a particular issue and say, okay, a particular set of young people in a particular country is facing the same issue. And it becomes completely different when it comes to different countries. And for example, a young person who is living in California, the, the social issue that person is facing is completely different from a young girl who is living in Bangladesh uh, because of the social cultural environment. But that is why it's important for young people to engage in uh, advocacy because only they know how they face these issues and they are the only one who can bring that authenticity in terms of solving these issues. Um, so uh, what does advocacy entail? I would like to summarize that into four words. Uh, and I'd like to make an action. I always like to do that because people will remember that. And I, I remember things this way. It helps me remember uh, you know, more complex idea. So I would say advocacy entails something called PACT, P-A-C-T. And I say PACT, and let me explain PACT for you. P is planning. As we know, we, we are trying to address a particular social issue, which is experiencing by young people. So we need more information, we need data, we need scientific evidence in terms of understanding what this issue is, how people are experiencing this issue, and um, you know what is, what is the research information in terms of what are the scientific solutions which we can bring forward in terms of solving these issues. So through that information, through that research, through that evidence, you can better plan in terms of solving that issue. A is action. So with that information, with that planning, how can we take action? As I said earlier, advocacy could be anything in terms of changing, uh, solving a particular issue. It could be a people uh, you know, coming up with a demonstration. It could be uh, uh, an article you will be writing. It could be uh, you know, social media campaigns and posts and you know, tweets and Instagram posts and things like that. It really could be anything. It could be theater. It could be a drama you are doing. It could be an actor. It could be like a... a um, uh, a, a social experiment or something like that. Uh, so second point is action. What kind of actions you can take in terms of solving that issue using the information you have. C is collaboration. Uh, advocacy, in my opinion, becomes more powerful when people actually got, get together and do it as a team. Rather than one person having a voice, the, you can amplify that voice when a group of people who are working for the same issue get together. It becomes more powerful um, when you actually work with uh, the people who have an influence in terms of making decisions. Rather than one person approaching them, it becomes more powerful, it becomes much stronger. A group of people come together and then putting pressure on them to create a, a policy change or address a social issue. So that's number three. Number four is transformation, T. So what we are trying to do is to create some change. And it's obviously going to be important to make sure that change is transformational because it's not, it shouldn't be a, a one-off thing where we just solve a particular issue by coming up with a particular policy. We all know in South Asia that <clears throat> we have so many policies in our countries. You know, most of those policies are nicely printed in wonderful publications and nicely filed in cabinet, right? But in the implementation, there are many challenges. So that's why the solution has to be transformational where we as advocates have to follow up with these institutions, follow up these decision makers to make sure that the proper policies are implemented. So what does advocacy entail? In my opinion, it's the fact. Planning, action, collaboration, and transformation. So. Myself, as a youth advocate, when I started working in 2011, uh, a youth volunteer of the Family Planning Association, we engaged with many advocacy efforts in terms of pushing for the abortion law in Sri Lanka, uh, having HIV workplace policy, we worked on the GDB policy in Sri Lanka, uh, we also uh, you know, engaged with other organizations like National Youth Services Council, so we really sort of experienced the power of young people getting together, because often, in these um, discussions around policy change, young people are not often engaged in those conversations because sometimes people think that you know we young people are just beneficiaries, young people are the ones who are just getting benefited from the program they are doing, so they should go and solve the problems on behalf of young people rather than really engaging them in 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 creating these solutions. So 
but it is really important for young people as citizens of our country to take civic action and and this is the best time to talk about this particular matter in sri lanka you know and most of you are joining from other south asian countries or other western countries um or any country for that matter must have you know seen on bbc or the guardian or wherever that you know people swimming in the president's swimming pool right like you know what's happening in the country of the economic crisis the political crisis people are actually taking action they are on the street they are protesting they are asking for a better political change they are asking for better living environment and living condition and that this is what i'm talking about you know it, it has to be a collaborative action where young people have a stronger voice and we use our voice to create social change by en engaging uh, decision makers um it doesn't necessarily need to be that right it can be a small effort you are doing in your community in terms of creating better access to health care or creating a road you know you get support from the admin local administrative divisions and really put pressure to petitions or to uh, like a project proposal you get their help you meet them and you engage them in conversations where collectively you try to solve their issue so it's important uh, to also understand that this is not an easy thing you know like is advocacy is a challenging thing yes definitely it's really challenging to create these social changes because we are working with layers and layers of uh, power uh, hierarchy and uh, and many levels of really creating different influences among those you know people so it's hard even for us to understand that although we have a strong voice that we can't really get into these discussion meetings and forums in terms of expressing ourselves so i'd like to conclude uh, and i know that you know we will we'll save a lot more time in terms of you know engaging in a true discussion because i know that all of you bring a lot of strong experience in terms of advocacy uh, how can how can we make sure that young people have a strong voice in terms of national regional and global level advocacy um and that we always make sure that we have a seat at the table uh and people often say that you know when you go to a discussion forum or you join a particular meeting to talk about a particular issue as a youth advocate sometimes you don't get an opportunity to speak up sometimes you don't get an get an opportunity to really sit in that forum and then contribute uh so my final remark in these er earlier interventions is that if you don't get a seat at the table that fine but make sure that you don't leave the room sit on the ground stand up but make sure you are part of the discussion and you are making sure that your voice is heard thank you Anish. thank you dakshita i think that's a, a very a uh, powerful note uh, to end your session on as well and i think that's one of the main things that we also you know are constantly trying to emphasize on that youth uh, should not necess necessarily be represented by other stakeholders or other people uh, i think we are also looking at spaces where youth are uh, fortunately in some contexts uh, being recognized as you know a uh, change agents and um people who do deserve to be at the forefront of these advocacy spaces and in fact um just to uh, also share something that came to mind while you were saying that um something that i also find really insightful is this really short um quote which says do whatever you can with what you have whenever you can so that's also very kind of reflective of Uh, as like you said um young people it it might be very easy especially in south asia to feel like you know um this is not the space for me or it's only a space that's held by experts or senior practitioners um but really it's it's a space that requires a lot of collective effort and that includes all of us and um i think you were able to resonate um that quite well as well and we appreciate you sharing your experiences um with us and hopefully we should we would be able to unpack some of the points you um highlighted uh maybe uh, uh, during the course of this session or as we proceed uh, in this learning series um so right now i'd actually like to hand it over now to uh sivanandi um so sivanandi if you could tell us a little bit about 
um, how is so Dakshita actually spoke about advocacy as a whole, and as you would imagine, as all of you would imagine, um, it's uh, quite a wide scope. It has many angles and layers to it. Um, so when you take youth-led advocacy in in particular, how is it different? And more importantly, how can it be different? Um, and I know that you've had a lot of experience in uh, national, regional, and global advocacy spaces, especially with uh, the Generation Equality Forum efforts. If you could also draw some of your experiences and share some of your insights uh, from that as well. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Renushi, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And you know, uh, Dakshita really explained uh, so beautifully, you know, uh, what is advocacy and what entails, you know, to be uh, a strong advocate, right, in the field. Um, so I, I thought I would just like, you know, maybe uh, I hope I can share a screen uh, because, um, okay, oh. Okay, so uh, it's not, oh, I can share my screen now? Sorry. Oh, is it possible for me to share my screen, Renushi? Sorry. Yeah, Siva, I think I made you co-host now. You should be able to. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. I want to share this and I hope you can see this in full. Uh, yeah, okay. Can you see this in full? Yeah, okay. Yes. So basically, I wanted to say who becomes an advocate, you know, uh, all of us uh, who are <laughs> gathered in the Zoom room, you know, had decided at some point or another that life was like pretty much, you know, uh, that the world was uh, full of different forms of injustices. So this is me as a three or four year old. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, and most of us were young people. I mean, most of me, my, my staff and my team were young people who looked at uh, the world and said, why is it the way it is, right? So I think that that's the first question. And I believe that all of us are also here, all of you who have gathered have that strong feeling, right? Uh, that there is something not right with the world and it may come from your own experience or you have witnessed someone else who is close to you who had this experience of injustice, right? And then you wanted to do something about it. So I feel like, uh, you know, this is one of the qualities that we have and that is the youthful quality that even you know, some of us who no longer fall into the youth con uh, category continue to go. Um, traditionally, I mean, I think that, that youth advocacy has had a long history, right? So even in the processes of uh, Cairo, which is the International Conference on Population and Development in 1994, um, that there were youth advocates who were already present there. Uh, and uh, many, many international NGOs also have incorporated uh, some form of uh, youth advocacy within their work. And of course, um, in the earlier days, you know, that youth um, inclusion um, was regarded by some as being very tokenistic, right? Because uh, they utilized young people. Uh, and well, it's not only young people, it's also, I guess, you know, civil society leaders from the global south. So it was tokenistic, our inclusion was tokenistic, but the agenda setting came very much from the older people uh, and most mostly, you know, uh, global north uh, and, um, you know, uh, Caucasians, right? So I guess, um, and this has changed now. Right. So you can see that the inclusion of young people is far more meaningful because uh, young people are beginning to say, uh, you know, nothing about us without us. So um, there is greater more and more meaningful participation of young people across most of the processes that we see. And but it's something that we always have to fight for is like, you know, and exactly what Dakshita said, you know, you not only want to sit at the table, but, you know, you also want to be, you know, holding the pen that's writing the decisions you want to be in the you should be in the positions of decision making right uh, in those uh, rooms which are about participation. So. Uh, and the other thing that I see different, you know, and how it's youth-led advocacy is different, that um, traditionally this youth advocacy, um, uh, you know, and sorry, traditionally advocacy was about a leader and who was able to mobilize other people around um, themselves or, um, or their organization, right? And you can see these models of organizations that came 
from uh, those uh, from that generation, right? That the organization was very much around the person or the persons who found it. So, um, but now we can find that you know youth uh, advocacy is very different, right? So you see this uh, this identity because young people understand you know how. Um, how, how, how complex the word identity is. Uh, it's no longer just women and men, right? Because we're economic citizens, we are digital citizens, we are sexual citizens, all at like, you know, at the same time. And uh, so the way that young people organize is, you know, far more, you know, creative and uh, far more, um, how do I say, uh, you know, out of the box than the way that traditional uh, traditionally, you could consider how advocacy was organized or run or done, right? Um, as you can see that because of the digital means, I've also found that, you know, many young people, you know, when they feel so strongly about that injustice, right, they are able to mobilize via either, um, you know, TikTok or social media, and it's just not one person, right? Then they form like a very organically a collective begins, right? And they start working with each other across borders and across boundaries. So I think that that's how, um, you know, youth-led uh, advocacy is far different from how uh, the traditional advocacy was uh, taking place. Um, and I think that sometimes, you know, it is um, the gap of organizations, you know, and uh, leaders in like, you know, uh, the civil society movements uh, that are not able to understand you know, this new, this new and changed uh, reality, right? And then so we go back to saying, oh, well, are you sure that's really advocacy? Or is it really advocacy? Or it's only advocacy when you talk to the prime minister or things like that. But um, I think that, you know, the way that, that mobilization, the thinking process, the collaborative process, uh, and, you know, the way to make change has happened has, you know, has been just so drastically shifted. Then the other one I wanted to show was this. Just give me a minute. My, yeah. So this is a part of that, you know, because uh, uh, of these multiple identities, the question of intersectionality uh, and being intersectional is very much part of the youth advocacy, right? Because you understand that how you know, economics affects, you know, sexual and reproductive health and rights, you know, uh, how digital rights uh, actually impact, you know, your economic rights, uh, you know, so all of those issues are interconnected, right? So this is, and uh, we also understand like how all of us in this multiple complex identities that we have, there are some which are, uh, which mean that we are oppressed and some which make us privileged, right? So for us to like kind of understand uh, this thing, like who really is privileged and who really is oppressed is uh, very much different from uh, uh, in the previous generations where, you know, okay, uh, men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed, you know, so th those are very clear cut lines. So here youth led advocacy um, uh, needs to be and is already in some way, this is why the call for intersectionality has come out so strong, isn't it? Because young people understand that there is so much of nuance as compared to uh, currently uh, compared to in the past. Um, yeah, the other one was okay. So. Uh, traditionally, you know, uh, a lot of us who were civil society activists and NGOs, especially the forefathers and the foremothers, if I can say so, uh, believed in the concept of incremental change, right? So everyone, all the governments uh, get together and they agree that, okay, these are going to be what we're doing. And then, you know, tomorrow we're going to do step one, you know, in two years time, we'll do step two, in like five years time, we'll do step five or whatever, right? Um, however, um, we know that that incremental change has not really brought the benefits of development uh, or the benefits to those who are at the bottom of the pyramid in our countries, right? And uh, many of the young people are actually asking for radical improvement or radical change. So I think that, uh, you know, whether it is in the climate marches, um, whether it is about sexual harassment, you know, so I feel like this, uh, this is the one thing where, you know, I feel um, that this is the power of young people who say like, you know, uh, you know change the system because we want, the system just isn't working for us, right? So I think that this is one way in which youth-led advocacy has been different. Let me see, what else do we have? Yeah, okay, so, and I think that that's a very, 
telling, and this is what I believe in youth-led advocacy, is because um, in the past we talked about, you know, bringing people from the margins into the center, you know, and, and that's when we said, oh, if all of those people who are in the vulnerable and oppressed communities, if we can just bring them closer and closer uh, to the center of power, then they would benefit more, right? But, um, but currently, you know, we realize that this is not possible. So now it's more about talking about how can we like explode the center, that there should be no center, right? Because the idea of the center itself concretizes this power dynamics, right? So, uh, and, uh, and the understanding that all, you know, oppression is connected in some way or another. And uh, sometimes people think that, oh, this is a very, this is far more complicated. Why are you doing things in a complicated manner when, you know, previously it was very simple? Because you see, at the end of the day, we know for sure, right? This person, this person who might have been, you know, oppressed or left behind in some way, it's that person still exists, you know, and that person is still within each and every one of us, right? So I think that this is where, you know, that youth-led advocacy has been different. It has been refreshing. Uh, and, you know, uh, and the youth-led advocacy puts this person, you know, at a pivotal point in their life and makes that person's uh, feelings and ideas and thoughts important, you know, and centers, uh, centers change on that moment uh, of, um, you know, realization of that oppression, right? So uh, this is why, you know, for me, I feel like, you know, youth-led uh, advocacy is creative and it's like much needed, but only much needed. I mean, it's like, uh, it, this is what's going to transform and change the world. Right, so that's uh, uh, maybe I can stop sharing here, and I can go back <laughs> to me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so uh, you had uh, Renushi and um, had also asked about you know the Generation Equality Forum. I know that many of you know that you know as Arrow. I mean, like uh, we are sometimes seen as a very strong organization, you know, in the area of uh, 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 advocacy. But, uh, you know, we too can get left out of tables, by the way, <laughs> exactly what Dakshita was saying, right? Uh, so I remember when they first started about uh, the Generation Equality Forum, they had invited something like, uh, what, uh, 40 uh, people to a meeting in Mexico. And uh, they were like, you know, and then they had put out this thing saying that, uh, and Arrow was, Arrow, or not only me, but not even any other staff of Arrow was one of that 40 who were invited. Uh, and um, uh, at, the, at, at that meeting, uh, somehow they had also put out publicly, I think it was UN Women, had put out publicly asking for what do you propose should be the themes that this 40 people in this room should decide on, right? Uh, and then so uh, that we said, okay, that we can do, okay? We're not in the room. Uh, we can't like wrangle ourselves into the room because everyone will say, hey, you know, if I let you in, I'll have to let uh, other people in and all of that, right? So um, we made the proposal that one of the themes should be sexual and reproductive health and rights, but with an emphasis on bodily autonomy, simply because that's what, um, how do I say, that's, that's where all of the uh, contested issues are, right? It's about bodily autonomy, right? So whether it's access to uh, uh, sexuality education, whether it's about access to safe abortion services. Uh, so bodily autonomy becomes very important because it's the last mile issue that you know people are, are not tackling because they don't want to give young people, uh, women and girls, rights over our own bodies, right? So <laughs> this is why it happens. Um, and so, uh, and then, uh, it's like how Dakshita says, you know, one of the things you will find is as you progress along this path, uh, you will meet many, many, many people. So as far as possible, uh, if you can build a network of uh, uh, friends, this is really helpful. So although we were not in a room, we had a friend in the room, right? And this person was a very, I mean, this person was a good friend, you know? So we said, hey, you're going for this meeting and we're not going for this meeting. We just want to let you know that we've submitted this theme and we want you to like be very vocal and say that this theme should be, you know, should be part of this. Uh, and so the fact that, um, so at the end of the meeting, of course, I mean, our friend was very vocal and, uh, you know, thanks to like, you know, kind of a, technique 
uh, technology, you know, people can give you updates all the time, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, uh, and she was able to fight for uh, and talk to the others and make sure that, you know, they became so SRHR with emphasis on bodily autonomy became one of the six action coalitions that were uh, uh, taken up, right, at the end as one of the key themes of the Generation Equality Forum. Then we know that UN Women set up the Civil Society Advisory Group. Group. Now, this is something you need to always, always be wary about as youth advocates. So there was a civil society advisory group that was formed. And what had happened was that 10 organizations had applied. And we, of course, then we said, OK, we were out of that room. We're not going to be out of this room. Right. So we decided to like, you know, apply to be uh, part of the civil society advisory group and we got selected. Um, and the civil society advisory group was something like 10 CSOs with one representative in New York who was joining the uh, UN women and the governments of France and Mexico on all of the how the you know how the conference would run, how would it be done and all of that stuff. Right. Now, where were the young people in this place? So. This is, and this is what I was going to say to be wary of. So parallel to the civil society advisory group, they formed a youth task force, right? And they put young people there, you know? And so this is what I mean, like, so you have to, this is where you have to interrogate about the participation, right? And you have to say, hey, uh, you know, is this really participation? Am I really being consulted? I mean, even if I'm being consulted, what I say, where is it going? Right. So what happened was that uh, we had worked with a couple of people from the youth task force to make sure that their voices uh, and the concerns of the youth were actually also reflected in everything the civil society uh, advisory group was doing. So I think that the person from there was from the Young Feminist Europe, Europe uh, Xenia Kellner, and she was, she was just an amazing advocate, right? So um, we did like, you know, so we worked closely to make sure that at least as far as we could, the civil society advisory group was incorporating those voices of, um, you know, young people in what we were recommending to both the UN women and the governments. So I think that, um, you know, uh, then of course we went on to do other things, but that's like, a lot, so I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Sure, Siva. Thank you so much. Um, I think you you raised a uh, multi-layered and some very very interesting advice, um, and also drawing from experience. I'm sure everyone present today was able to learn a lot. And personally, um, so a few things you said, like for example, how youth-led advocacy is different, and how Muslim are have been organic collectives as opposed to like the traditional forms of advocacy. And that actually reminded me of um, this was just the way I observe it, but some of the best social movements out there have been organic and um, have been led uh, to a certain extent by youth who have also worked with other stakeholders together. Um, and you also pointed uh, to the fact of intersectionality and how uh, youth-led advocacy especially has kind of um, highlighted the importance of it because without it, it's not really, uh, I mean, who are you standing for? It's, it's important to understand that everything really is connected, especially when you talk of social issues. Um, I just want to uh, quickly check with Samita. I think you had um, asked something on the chat box. I'm just wondering if you want to um, unmute and share your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe maybe uh, uh, Shiva, you can take it at the end, or if, if possible, even now. Uh, we have heard a lot of people uh, saying that uh, when it comes to planning advocacy, uh, or you know, like um, uh, bringing in a key issue, uh, that data is very important, and which is what we are always lacking, you know, uh, when it comes to mostly uh, countries like us in South Asia that. Uh, data is very scattered and uh, sometimes not enough or, or like, you know, there's no national common data. So that is somewhere that we go, uh, get stuck all the time. So I'm just thinking like, uh, rather than just worrying about data, whether there are any other ways that we can think of, you know, just start over with whatever you have, what, what would be your kind of, you know, what from your experience, what can you uh, tell the young people about that? Okay, so definitely, I must say that, um, you know, uh, when I came to SRHR, it was like a very, uh, well, it's, uh, sexual reproductive health and rights is a very difficult field, right? Because it is an overlap of public health, 
then you have demography as a dis discipline and then you have women's rights you know so uh, this uh, three layers uh, mean that in any room that i went to uh, there were you know public health people and demographers you know and demographers are numbers people they only care about the numbers right so whatever i wanted to say uh, nobody would take it into um, consideration simply because there were no numbers to it so uh, so i felt very strongly that you know I, I should try to kind of empower myself with the numbers so um, uh, very um, so i started reading and uh, you know sometimes there are more numbers out there then you realize, you know. So I think if I'm not mistaken, Sri Lanka has a, okay, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, I know for sure has the demographic health surveys, you know. And I have a feeling uh, uh, Sri Lanka might have had it, but I'm not sure, right. But the thing is, like, so if you're coming from those countries, if you go and read, you can just go to uh, just search demographic health survey, Bangladesh or Nepal or India, uh, Pakistan, you will definitely get this whole big book. And if you read it, you will find a lot of numbers, both quantitative as well as like some comments that they will make, right? Uh, and that is something that you can like pluck up and put it inside there, right? So um, uh, in some of those countries, uh, even by uh, what is called the chapter on violence. So violence uh, against women, um, I think definitely India subscribes to that. So you can actually go and say, oh, one in how many people, or you can use uh, WHO. So um, I feel like, you know, uh, if, we can, I mean, maybe this is something we can do much later because uh, Arrow also runs a data-driven advocacy kind of capacity strengthening. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe, you know, we can like kind of uh, help, um, you know, uh, broker that. I mean, like we can do that for the Men Engage uh, uh, Alliance as well, right? So this yes. might be useful for you all, yes. So for me, I feel, and then, so that's one aspect of it. The second one is, of course, that, um, not all the data will be there, right? So you can use your story starting with this, and then you can bring in, you know, stories uh, that you have gotten from your shelters or from your organizations. If you do like surveys of young people, you know, uh, or the young people in the community, and then you can say, well, this is what the big number says, but you know, this is what our findings show, right? So that mm -hmm. is like a little bit more easily done. So you have the quantitative balance with your own qualitative data so your mm -hmm. uh, what information you have gets elevated you know so that's a data mm -hmm. approach but i can tell you that sometimes this data is just uh how do i say it's something that uh decision makers tell us because they say oh if we have the data we can make the change right yes. but that's not but that's you know that's not true yes. right uh, decision makers can make a change anytime. So that's why I feel like, you know, some of this mobilization, communications, that those type of pressures also need to exist, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not always just the numbers, you know? Right, yes. Thank you. Um, so I think we can uh, then move on to Chamatia. Um, so Chamatia, I, I, you have uh, also similarly been someone who's had um, a lot of experience both in Sri Lanka as well uh, as the global level. You are currently a board member of the World Association for Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. You've also done a lot of uh, work at the local level, um, engaging with youth. Uh, and so drawing from your experience, if you could just uh, talk to the participants a bit about, um, I'm sure we have a few uh, new people who want to um, uh, learn more about what kind of skills they should hone. Um, what should they be mindful of uh, if they want to grow as advocates? Um, but also, um, like, take into account in a region like South Asia, uh, what they need to keep in mind and what kind of skills would they need to influence policy, to influence laws, um, and, and basically in the broad advocacy spaces as a whole. Um, just your advice, uh, and a few tips as to what you think they should know. Thanks, Renishi. Um, and I think uh, with the incredible insights from both uh, Dakshita and Steva, and I think I myself have been a youth advocate who have been inspired by their you know, experiences and their journeys too. Um, I think 
you know, I, I don't think I could give like, you know, advice or tips as such because there's there's no like, you know, uh, because our own journeys would be very different to, you know, the different courses that we would work in. And there's no such as a, you know, like a checklist. Okay, if you have this, 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 then you are, you know, sorted as a as an advocate. Um, because, you know, the kind of experiences as you go along that because the journey is very different. Um, but I think both Dakshita and Siva really captured, you know, uh, from their experiences, how in reality, you know, advocacy is going to look like. Um, and also, you know, what really entails in that uh, whole advocacy space. Um, one thing is that I feel uh, I would probably emphasize is that, you know, regardless of your understanding of uh, advocacy, you know, you yourself has your own kind of experience. Your, you know, you, um, you can build your own advocacy journey. Um, again, I think in terms of skills, it's very different to say, you know, this is the kind of package of skills you need to have. But I think we uh, listened to so much of, you know, what kind of um, advocacy, what advocacy is and, you know, how, uh, you know, as young people or as an advocate, you know, what kind of a journey it would be or how different it would be. So I would like to get uh, some engagement from the uh, participants too. So maybe we do like a little activity to energize also because we've been listening to such amazing uh, contributions from both Dakshita and uh, Siva. So um, I would actually like to ask the participants themselves what they think as you build your advocacy campaign or you know you you want to advocate for something. What kind of skills do you think? would be useful for you in doing that or what you think you could probably be improving or could be gaining, you know, it could be your certain values, certain skills that you feel, um, you know, you might need uh, in, in building that. And so I would like to hear from the, uh, from the participants, maybe you can add it in the chat box and we'll see who's sharing what. So now you all heard about, um, sorry, did I? No, sorry, Shabatya, go ahead. Yeah, and feel free to, if you can unmute and share it with us, feel free to do that. Let's keep it as engaging and interactive as possible. What skills do you think that uh, would be useful when kind of, you know, implementing now that you have heard what advocacy, you know, looks like and what it could kind of come in, in your journey? Uh, let's see what skills do you think. And there's no right or wrong answer. So feel free to share what you feel uh, you would need or would be useful for you in building that campaign. Chamatya, just to start off the conversation so that you know it will help others also to come in. Um, yeah. I, I, I just want to um, share uh, some, some of my thoughts. You know, sometimes uh, when we say advocates, we understand them as a different kind of people, you know, like uh, they are different from us, but we, we never do understand that from our own ends in our daily lives that we do advocate for things, you know, even within your own household. So, uh, I, I mean, like, uh, uh, how do we like, you know, uh, uh, make sure that, you know, that, that your own advocacy as a, as a, simple person can make a long way, you know, to change something. I mean, that, that had always, uh, some, that is something that always young people had been asking me. So maybe I can put that as a... <laughs> as, as a question, but also I think, thanks Samita for that. And until everyone puts in your answers in the chat, I'll also touch upon certain, like, you know, the areas that you uh, specified, certain myths around uh, advocacy. Uh, especially, I think uh, when we speak about advocacy, a lot of people think that it's, you know, like politically affiliated or you need to have a certain activism background. But just like you said, um, Samita, it's also, um, you know, you yourself is an advocate in different ways. You know, it's just that you don't necessarily have to be somebody coming from a very strong, you know, political background or advocacy background. And people often think it's, you know, it's just the, uh, the you know, uh, activists or lawyers or, or policy mix who, who are, you know, into advocacy, but it, I think it's, it's uh, certain myths and misconceptions you have around uh, advocacy. 
And I think it's also sometimes people think, okay, advocacy is just for the experts, but not necessarily, I think, right? Fully how some they explained how people, you know, kind of uh, uh, use advocacy in, in different ways. And I can, you know, share from my experience as a young girl in school, how I advocated for a certain change uh, to my principal and then to the Ministry of Education and was able to kind of uh, have that change in the school. So, so you kind of, you don't necessarily have to be that expert to really practice your, or, you know, to kind of advocate for a change that you really need to see happening. Um, and also sometimes people think that it's, it's also about, you know, all these big global problems and doing massive projects. But your idea could be a simple one and you can start very simple, but it can have a larger impact. You don't, you never know how it will, can kind of impact the change that you want to see in your community and could even have a national level. So I, uh, you know, like, um, like uh, Renu, she explained, I work with the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, uh, and we are the largest voluntary movement for girls and young women, and we are based in 152 countries, um, and we primarily work with adolescent girls and young women. So um, whenever we speak about advocacy, uh, it, you know, I come from a gender issues related background, but different people work on different issues. And it, it, it could be as simple as you know, asking for a change and demanding a certain change within your school or even a larger national policy or lawmaking level. So I think it's important to kind of bust those myths and really understand what, um, you know, that you could be advocating for the change that you wish to see. Um, also, I think I, I also see in the chat, there are some answers coming in. What are the skills that we need um, to, to, you know, have uh, your advocacy? And I see Romesa sharing that it's clear communication, articulation, compassion. And I think Renishi is saying it's networking. Uh, thank you very much for, and I think Rashid is saying negotiator, definitely. Um, so, so that, that I think you, cannot say that these are the only skills you could have or you don't need these skills. But definitely communication skills from your negotiation skills to public speaking to you know writing to different target audiences to you know really building a social media campaign. Uh, all of these are very could be very crucial in really having a successful advocacy campaign. Um, and I can say from my experience sometimes uh, you know, when you speak to, for example, decision makers and coming from a South Asian or Sri Lankan background, I, you know, you often have to speak to government authorities and people who, are, who don't necessarily have the same kind of passion and drive to, or rather understand, you know, what you're asking for. So you really need to have that um, ability to, you know, speak and convince, negotiate with those uh, people. Uh, and another important thing is that sometimes people think, you know, when you go to like a Ministry of Women's Affairs or a Child Affairs or any other governmental authority, the people working there would be having that, uh, you know, be a feminist or a person who has the same kind of passion or drive or interest, uh, because sometimes they are being placed there for their job, not necessarily have the same kind of understanding and drive like. Uh, uh, activist or a youth advocate would, would be going there. So I've come across situations, people who just, you know, ignored what I'm saying or have said, we have 1,100 problems and, you know, gender-based violence is right now not our priority. Uh, and, and you will come across people like that for sure when you kind of, you know, especially uh, go to work with certain government authorities and uh, you will find people who try to avoid you uh, who would try to kind of uh, ignore what you're saying, uh, or sometimes they will all accept, oh, yes, 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 we understand, but then they will put what you're sharing the next moment. So I think it's important to have as much as you have this, you know, for example, the technical skills like, uh, you know, project management, planning, time management, all of that skills that you need to really have a successful delivery of your campaign. 
but at the same time, certain values of, you know, really being patient with the work you're doing. And sometimes you might not be able to achieve what you want in the first go, but I think you have to keep pushing. Uh, so it's more or less it's uh, pushing the pushback. Uh, you will find so many people who will come to support you, who will really cheer, champion the work you're doing and will really be part of that journey. But at the same time, you will equally find people who would put, that, put those obstacles and, and make it very challenging experience. So you need to have that never give up attitude um, and, and you know, really keep driving for what you believe in. Uh, we work with so many young girls uh, across the world. And one thing that we um, often really highlight is the, the passion, the drive and the interest they have and the commitment they have for the cause. That really keeps them going with their campaigns because I'm sure there will be so many moments that you will feel like this is not working out, but I think it's about keeping that enthusiasm that you have for that cause and really driving it forward. Um, and I think also it's important to understand that um, as you build uh, you know, your campaign or your advocacy projects, you will also come across so many challenges in finding resourcing, in uh, you know, making sure that it reaches out to the audience that you really target for. So I think it, it's also about how you manage those moments, those situations, how you adapt to certain um, uh, you know, situations and, and being able to have a critical thinking around uh, how to go and build your strategy around how to make it successful. Um, and also think creatively and, and unique uh, you know, thought is very important. Um, I think, again, it's, it's it's very hard to say these are the skills you would need and this is, you know, this you won't need because when you work on different issues, you will need, you know, different experiences and, and skills. One example I could also give, I think, um, thankfully, uh, Siva actually touched uh, upon that, the Generation Equality Youth Task Force, and I myself is a member of the Youth Task Force. Um, I think Siva beautifully captured what happened with you know, being uh, a youth structure being put in place, but not necessarily giving that, uh, you know, including and uh, having that youth leadership per se. Uh, one thing that we had to advocate within that, uh, you know, uh, space is to asking a seat at the decision-making table, because we ourselves did not want to be that structure that would, you know, just be put in place to consult and, you know, get, uh, contributions, but not necessarily having that, uh, you know, authority or the power to influence certain decisions that would, you know, happen within that space. Um, so after, you know, like the pushbacks we had and pushing them, we were successful in getting a seat at the, the core group, which, which was the key uh, decision-making uh, body in the generation equality. And I think for us, it was one of the, uh, you know, successes of our kind of youth participation, youth uh, leadership journey within the generation equality, but also, you know, we were also able to get uh, so many more, you know, other young people involved through the actions we did, uh, you know, through our different networks. So for example, I myself built a, a group of around 300 uh, adolescents and young women who were able to be part of that generation equality journey. Uh, and they also went through advocacy kind of sessions and learn how to kind of, uh, you know, demand for the changes that you believe in, how to kind of understand what happens in these policy dis discussions and how to negotiate and all of these skills. Um, and one other point that I would like to say is also often when we speak about youth, uh, it, it falls in the age group of 18 to 30 and uh, often the adolescent age group get infected because of the certain, you know, tough uh, safeguarding areas that we have to keep in mind when we engage adolescents. But I think it's about us creating those safe environments and, and making sure those structures are put in place so that we can have that adolescent voice also included. Um, and it's very important for us to have, uh, you know, 
this intergenerational voice and representation within our uh, you know, spaces. Um, and I've been advocating for that too with, with my work. Uh, and I keep kind of um, pushing for that too. Uh, but also I can share one other experience, uh, you know, we spoke about, and I think Rashid said negotiator, right? So um, I remember being a very young advocate, I think probably around 18, 19, and uh, going for the commission on the status of women, uh, which happens every year. Uh, and so many activists who are working on different gender issues, you know, meet up in, in New York uh, to, uh, you know, uh, demand for change. And uh, before, you know, attending CSW, I had to kind of uh, meet the respective national delegation um, and, uh, you know, the government authorities. And even when I, uh, you know, went to New York, I had to meet the representative uh, in the permanent and, and my experience kind of, kind of helped me understand the challenging uh, part around youth advocacy. So it's, it's very easy for us to kind of, you know, celebrate all the achievements we've got, the journeys we've had, but it has equally been a very challenging experience to really make sure your voice is being heard. Um, and I'm somebody who also challenged the organizations I've worked in itself to have meaningful youth participation and leadership. Because you often find people listening to you, but not necessarily really taking into consideration. So I feel when we speak about you know, uh, youth participation and leadership and having that uh, inclusive spaces, I think people already in those spaces also need to have that uh, change in mindset, change in perception. Um, and it's, it's very easy for us to have that tokenistic way of saying, oh, we click this box, we have box, we have this uh, person and we are sorted, but not necessarily really making that space inclusive, safe, meaningful for their engagement, for their contribution. So uh, I would really request all of you uh, who are, you know, going to be or who are already a youth advocates to really keep in mind uh, some of your experiences and try to uh, create a space which is different for young people who will be coming into that space after you. So, you know, whatever the experiences you uh, gain through your journey will really help you build a better space for other youth advocates when they get into this space. So with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any questions, comments later on. Thank you so much, Shamatya. And um, I think you made a very strong point about how, uh, like you said, there's no fixed set of skills when it comes to advocacy. It can depend on a lot of things, um, such as, I don't know, your strengths and weaknesses, the kinds of issues you deal with, to the kinds of spaces that you want to engage in. Um, so I think it's important to keep that in mind and uh, figure out, you know, what works best for each of us. Um, I just want to highlight one more comment that I think Pooja had uh, left on the our chat. Um, so while engaging on advocacy campaigns, the most things that work well are working close with governments and making them partners. Protests always don't work until it's backed by powerful people. It's all from my experience. Thank you, Pooja, for sharing that. I think that's also a very important uh, insight. I'm just wondering if any of the uh, discussants um, have anything to comment on that. I don't know, Dakshita or even Siva, if um, you just want to quickly comment or reflect on that. Sure, Venushi. So I, I I think that's a very great reflection, right? And and all of us are speaking from our own experiences and our observations. And and I think uh, what Pooja is saying is uh, obviously realistically applicable. And I think in my experience that there's no secret source advocacy. I think it depends on the context you are working on, depends on the issue you are focusing on and the type of people you are partnering with and with whom to, to with whom you're advocating for. Uh, so at, at cases where it is better to work with the government stakeholders uh, on a more formal setting, uh, I think that's the best approach to take. 
but sometimes we we realize that like just like the current political context in Sri Lanka that sometimes it is important to also show the power of people by protesting and we can't can't say you know one approach is better than the other i think it always depend on the context we are working on and what issues we are speaking on behalf of um so you know uh, again it doesn't necessarily need to be powerful people or strong people or influencers we as citizens individually when we collect when we connect uh, as a collective that collective voice is strong enough to 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 hold the policy makers to account because at the end of the day if you are looking at politicians we are the one who have a right to vote to elect them to back in to come back into power right we appoint them using our votes so we have that ultimate power in terms of voting so it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, you know strong strong personality is joining obviously that would that would help the cause but every one of us as individuals have that strength have that power to create influence so uh, we need to be very strategic in terms of using the tactics and the tools to advocate for a particular issue if we can have negotiations if we can have conversations we can use creative means we can use social media to advocate for a particular issue but sometimes it's also important to protest and and, and through that you know people uh, in the decision makers realize that you know people are not happy and sometimes it might really help them you know create some change for an example in sri lanka we saw um uh you know uh, the the current government the former government actually stepping down because people were actually protesting uh, we saw uh, for 2015 elections where artists civil society women's groups young people university students trade unions all of us got together and started campaigning against the corrupt regime and we saw how that helped people to appoint a new set of you know politicians so uh, we can bring like so many examples like that so it doesn't necessarily mean that uh the you know the, there's a good way to do this so there's another way to do it i think we need to be very strategic in terms of identifying our advocacy methods and tools and if i can spend another like a minute or two responding to samita's question around you know e- e- is it a good thing to start with the easy advocacy issues and when e- when is the correct time to focus on the difficult advocacy issues uh and some of i think that's a, that is a real struggle uh and then i i feel that it is hard to honestly say that you know one advocacy issue is easy and another one is difficult i think particularly uh any change we are expecting is quite challenging uh but i do agree that sometimes based on based on what we are advocating for we can pick certain issues to create an entry point i think understanding and identifying these advocacy windows where there is a conversation already going around changing a particular policy or updating a particular policy or we understand that there is a there's a sense of community action community voice or media is focusing on a particular uh, particular issue we need to identify those advocacy windows and then engage in in our discussions for an example um Sri Lanka has a very restrictive abortion law where uh the 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 abortion is only available legally if there's a threat uh, if the the pregnancy is a threat to the life of the mother and ideally in my opinion the human rights point of view is that when we advocate to change this law we need to advocate that every woman should be able to have that right and have that choice to go for an abortion whenever she whenever she wants right that is the ultimate goal but sometimes uh advocating for that in sri lanka we have realized that it's it's a very challenging thing so an entry point would be uh you know we talk about rape we talk about incest and uh we talk about fetal abnormalities and and through that we can start the conversation with the policy makers and the decision makers about changing the current abortion law and through that opening we can push for our ultimate goal so i think strategically we need to find ways in terms of identifying these policy windows and how we can have this conversation of influencing addition makers 
and and through those openings we can continue our conversation further and reach to uh, the ultimate advocacy goal thank you dakshita um so we do have uh, i know that uh, we are planning to wrap up by 5.30 Sri Lanka time. We do have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we'd like encourage anyone to unmute. Uh, if you have any questions, I know that um, we did go into a multi-layered, um, we, we explored many angles. So feel free to um, unmute and ask your questions, share your comments. Now is the time. Yeah, Shihara, go ahead. Hi, yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is this, I, this goes out to all three panelists. Uh, this is one thing that has been sort of a conundrum in my head for the past couple of years is where a lot of Western countries tend to have a lobbying system with their governments, like that's like a mediatory kind of um, between civil organized civic societies and the government. And they often seem to work in Western countries because their systems are so, um, I would say organized to a great extent for such um, mediums to work. But when it goes to Asian countries, a uh, best example is the one that I'm coming from, that is Sri Lanka. Uh, such systems cannot really work as effectively as we'd like it to. Like, sure, there are lobbyists, but it really doesn't go far. And as someone else also mentioned, our protests can only work to some extent, but there has to be a point where you need to mediate and come in and sort of you know negotiate. Um, so what do you think would be the best way forward to increase that level of mediation in countries such as Sri Lanka, where it's not the most structured or the most corrupt, free kind of democracy that's in place? Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe I can take a stab at this. I mean, it's not really easy. Um, I think uh, it actually goes back to um, the the first question, right? I mean, how much do you actually, you know, work with government or how do you work with government, you know? Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes uh, we do have this thing in um, advocacy, right? I mean, like uh, people tell us, you know, go for the low hanging fruit. And we very often think, okay, let me just, let me work with the government. But you see, you as an organization or you as a collective, you will have some principles by which you uh, uh, work, right? As long as those principles are not compromised, I feel you can work with government. But if you feel that your principles are, the principles that you have chosen for yourself, well, not just any principles, uh, um, if you if those principles are compromised, you will know that you know very people will call you out, right? And people will call the organization out, right? So I think that that one uh, you just have to keep it in mind. Like, do I work or do I not work? Um, and because government is powerful, they can actually um, how do I say? They can ask you to reduce your agenda. Like for example, in Malaysia. You know, uh, we have a very good relationship with the government, you know, and sometimes they also raise questions and say like, you know, but we think that, you know, you talk about LGBTIQ rights and, you know, um, we think that you uh, uh, and, and that's not compatible with our society or our religion. And um, so, you know, uh, maybe, you know, what, what are you going to do about it? Well, I can't like not do LGBTIQ rights because the government has asked me to do so that I can be a better partner to the government, right? So the thing is to like, how do you then um, negotiate that situation? Now, when you're talking about, you know, civil society in Western countries who are able to uh, mediate with their government, I'm not really sure that that is true. You know, on some issues, yes, but not on all issues. You know, uh, I, I feel like if you are looking at countries like, you know, either Poland or um, who's this, Hungary, you know, so there, you know, the rights movements are still very, you know, I mean, are being clamped down on, right? Um, and I think that uh, it also means that um, uh, some of those things, whether they're about indigenous people, uh, whether it's about the climate, I mean, like those lobby groups are not very effective, right? So uh, I think that uh, where uh, the lobby groups seem to be effective with politicians is when they can channel money. 
and and I doubt that we will be able to, as our uh, uh, as our issues stand, be able to channel money to politicians, right? So I think that uh, uh, for me, I feel like uh, lobbying should not um, should not be the way that we go ahead. Uh, with that, right? Because lobbying means having power to skew the process in your favor. And uh, I, I, what I feel is like we should try to make the process, you know, better, you know, more robust, you know, through participation, through inclusion, and um, through, you know, rigorous uh, uh, setting of an agenda and questioning or, you know, planning, all of those things uh, are far more important for a process that leads to a good decision for everyone. So, yeah. Thank you very much. That is very insightful. Uh, thanks, Siva. I think um, there was one more question uh, by Samita directed to you. Um, so she oh, asked- yeah. Sorry, yeah. What was the question? Sorry, I missed it. No, that's fine. So can you also share your thoughts on, import, on the importance of building local evidence for regional advocacy? Yeah, I think it's actually uh, very, very critical because um, uh, I think that, um, you know, where we want to show the gaps with like, for example, um, uh, you know, whether it is with uh, uh, groups that are completely marginalized and not represented in the data at all. Right. Uh, so like whether it's indigenous migrant workers or, you know, garment factory workers, those kind of, uh, you know, special groups that you want to look at, you know, and what their situation is uh, with realizing whether they're, you know, sexual reproductive health. Uh, so how so that kind of uh, data helps you uh, say, how do I say, raise the um, how do I say, raise the situation of that group. Right. So uh, and that can be a global thing. Right. Because let's say uh, female garment factory workers are not unique to just Sri Lanka. You know, so you will find people in Cambodia, people in like, you know, uh, Nepal or Morocco or, you know, where, you know, Turkey, where there are these factories, uh, Bangladesh, you know, so then you will find that there is a whole group that emerges from your local evidence. So I feel like your local evidence can go all the way to global, you know, and create uh, a story for a group. Thank you, thanks. Um, just, uh, I know we have uh, almost short of time, but any um, final questions uh, for the speakers or even anything that you would like to share among ourselves? Uh, Reno Shahai here, Kapila. So I just want to tell you that uh, advocacy, of course, we all know it's a process as well as sometimes we should have a patience like uh, to wait maybe maybe 100 years, sometimes maybe 200 years because we know when you talk about women's rights moments and everything, like it took a long time, but there were small, small steps like what Samita said, like simple, simple steps maybe like from home, from community, from from individual person, from the government, from the network. Uh, yeah, so therefore, I think everybody, we are putting some waves to the sea. It's like advocacy is a kind of ocean, but we are contributing something for our purpose, but it will take some time. It will take some long period of time, maybe short period of time. But if we believe it, I think there's opportunity to, to create a good advocacy campaign as well as to, to achieve our goals. So therefore, everybody may be, uh, everybody contributing. And, and also we should not uh, lose our hope. Sometime we, we will maybe adjust our campaign, the model of the campaign. So therefore, I just want to contribute like, it's our simple steps as well as different way we will contribute. It will take some time. It will not maybe take long time. So, but we should believe our purpose, our goals, our our uh, our dreams for yeah. the betterment of the of our purpose. Yeah, that's it. 
Thank you, Kapila. And I think that's a really uh, wonderful point to end the session on as well. Um, sometimes, and I think that reminded me of something I heard of recently as well, that's this whole conversation on like a system change that we speak, especially in Sri Lanka with the protests. That's one of the main things that people are demanding. And I think it's often when you're part of such a huge collective, you tend to underestimate our individual contributions, especially when you're young as a youth change agent. So, um, not to basically underestimate the small changes that build up to that system change, which would one day be acknowledged um, as a large as part of a larger effort. Um, but also um, just a huge thank you to uh, Chamatya, Dakshita and Siva uh, for that very, very productive discussion and for all the attendees for joining us today. And we hope to see you next time as well as active um, participants of the series. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, depending on where you're at, have a good day and or have a great evening. Thank you.